Hello, uh, good evening and welcome to this edition of Ask Your Doctor. I'm Dr. Alan Thornhill. I've been working in the field of IVF now for over 25 years in a variety of different roles, starting as a clinical embryologist uh, in the lab, in industry, working for the UK's fertility regulator, and now providing support and guidance for patients as a fertility coach. This evening, I'll be your host for what's going to be a very interesting session. In IVF, there's an understandable focus on the embryo, um, how to make it and how to identify the best quality one. But tonight, we're going to be focusing on a different but equally important issue. I'm joined tonight by an excellent group of panellists who are here to help you better understand how to prepare for an embryo transfer to improve your chances. There's more to consider than just the endometrium. They are Dr. Joaquin Yasse, um, from medical director of Gyn FIV, I probably not said that right, in Spain. Uh, Dr. Marcel Stelkel, uh, chief physician of Repogenesis in Czech Republic. And Dr. Eleftherios Meridis, uh, scientific director of IVF serum in Greece. Um, we'll start by asking each of our panelists to answer one of three sort of fundamental questions to get us, you know, to get us all into the room at the same level, um, to provide a brief introduction to the topic tonight. Uh, then we'll answer your questions and please make sure you send in your questions. But if I can ask, please, that you put them in the Q&A box um, rather than the comments box. Otherwise, I'm flicking between the two and it gets a little bit, you know, it gets a bit confusing for everybody. Um, that will help us to deal with all of them. We'll try to answer all of them. Hopefully, there'll be lots. But I will prioritize the ones that are simplest to understand and answer and, and more generalizable. Um, the ones that haven't already been answered, because sometimes if you come in a bit late, you, answer, you ask the same question that's been asked. And you can always watch it on catch up later if, if you miss something. Um, and that's and, and stick to tonight's topic because we always get a few questions that are a little bit left field and that's okay but I'll focus on the ones that are based on this topic uh, just in the interest of time so we've got about an hour um, and the first question uh, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Joaquin to, to answer which is just to give us a brief overview of endometrial preparation because you can't you know I think it was who said before we started we can't have this conversation without talking about the endometrium so just briefly though can you give us a little overview please well, the, the endometrial preparation is, is uh, well, nowadays is the key of the situation because some, some years ago, the endometrial preparation is the same that the, the ovarian stimulation during the first embryo transfer. But nowadays, approximately in our clinic, 80% uh, of the embryo transfer are frozen embryo transfer. So we can, uh, well, think about the, the, the best uh, way to, to do the embryo transfer, uh, to prepare the endometrial for the embryo transfer. And uh, now we, we must take into consideration different questions, the, the efficacy, and, but not only the efficacy, that the, the, the treatment must be comfortable for the patient. And we must take into account that uh, the, the, to plan the embryo transfer must be, uh, well, the, the, in, the, in the best way to, uh, well, to have a family balance, to have a, a, a work balance with the, with the treatment and, and the, the one of our priorities when we uh, face to prepare the endometrium for an embryo transfer is to, uh, well, the, the, the patients must uh, continue with the normal daily life and not have restrictions in order to, to plan the embryo transfer. This is the key of the situation because the efficacy is not, uh, uh, well, especially different with the, the, in the different methods. Okay. So it's good. I've, I've already seen a question come in. So I know that we'll cover some actual specifics to the endometrium. Let, let's stop there and move on to a different, uh, the next question. But I think we're going to be bringing a lot more in. So um, this will be uh, to Dr. Stelko. Um, can you say a little bit, you know, overview about medications that might be needed and anything a little bit left field? Because certainly in stimulation, we get some different medications. But so medications for... Um, uh, a medicated cycle, I suppose, or even a modified natural, and any supplements that might be helpful, please. Okay, okay, okay. So, first of all, uh, I would like to tell that I prefer a natural cycle, a natural cycle if it is possible. Okay? Uh, there are some cases uh, in which it is it's not possible, for example, women without spontaneous ovulation, but also cases, for example, when I prepare uh, women from France and uh, it's necessary to, to prepare everything, flight, uh, accommodation, and so on and so on. So I, in in these cases, I prefer artificial medication. Okay, 
why a natural cycle because uh, the effectivity patients sometimes believe that with some medication is better okay, but it's not true we all we all know it and uh, the safety during uh, late pregnancy is better after a natural cycle than after uh, artificial cycle so if it is possible i uh, use natural cycle and only progesterone supplementation um, I don't prefer to, to to complete natural cycle. Usually, I use, for example, uh, 400 milligrams per day of uh, some progesterone, vagin uh, vaginal progesterone. In artificial cycles, there are three ways how to uh, how to get uh, into the body pro uh, estradiol uh, by oral way, uh, by vaginal way, and uh, through the skin like patches. Uh, oral way, vaginal way, I, I like it very much, but uh, there is some disadvantage uh, if uh, in case uh, of some inflammation of vagina, it's impossible to continue um, uh, with this application. So usually we have 50 to 50% 50 oral or vaginal uh, su supplementation of estradiol. And in some cases, uh, I use also transdermal application. I think that all three ways are comparable. There, there is no any advantage. Maybe for a way, sometimes it can be like uh, stomach, like on the sea, okay? So it can be some stomach problems, but uh, I don't think that uh, some of these ways is better for, for success. So I think it's overall, overall my opinion about, uh, about medication. I don't believe much that uh, more medication is better, like uh, low molecular heparin or aspirin or something like this. Uh, if it is not indicated, I, I don't don't use it, and I, I hate corticoids. Okay. okay. Um, Thank you. So I think, that, yeah, yeah, I think we should ask the other doctors because I'm sure there's going to be some variation in in preparation. So please, Dr. Maridis. Yeah, I'm, what you got to say. I think um, first of all we have to. Um, um, decide if we're going to speak about medication we're going to give for uh, transferring fresh embryos uh, or we're going to what medication for what preparation we're doing for transferring frozen embryos um, because it's a different situation when you have fresh embryos you have basically you have just come from a stimulated cycle right or from a natural cycle so you have already given some medication right so uh, so you are you have the ovulation and then a few days later you decide you're going to transfer day two or day three or day five embryos so you are basically following um, a stimulation cycle or natural cycle but you have fresh embryos and there is a kind of preparation you can give for the transfer of fresh embryos on the other hand there is another preparation which can be kind of similar but also different when you have to transfer frozen embryos now each decision has its advantages and disadvantages Okay, there can be like um, variations in the medication you're going to give. But um, <clears throat> you, you, I mean, <clears throat> again, if you have frozen embryos, right, and you want to transfer them to a patient, you can choose, also have the choice if you're going to transfer them in a new natural cycle or you're going to transfer them into a downregulated, medicated cycle. I don't know if you follow me. So, um, mm -hmm. again, there are some advantages and disadvantages. And it depends on the patient, um, basically, to decide what protocol will be more um, suitable for the needs of that patient. For example, my opinion is that if you have frozen embryos, right, and you have a patient that you want to transfer the frozen embryos, and you know that there is a problem with um, endometrial thickness, okay, um, you cannot always depend on the quality of the endometrium that is going to be um, grown during a natural cycle. You have to assist, okay, by giving some, um, you know, uh, estrogens, right, in order to improve the thickness of the endometrial lining. But also, sometimes this is not, you know, this is not enough. If you have a patient that has a severe lining issue, you may need to downregulate this is my opinion. You need to downregulate the patient. So uh, after he, she has her period, you can start with, you medicated with uh, estrogen. And then you have the luxury of actually 
um, having more days of estrogen supplementation to reach the ideal thickness of endometrium. So you are not in a hurry because you, you think the patient is going to ovulate or whatever, and you don't rely on the estrogens produced by the ovary, right? By a follicle. So you have the extra advantage that you can delay your transfer. You can give estrogen for like 14, 16, 18 days before you achieve the desired uh, endometrial thickness, and then you start the luteinization process. Okay, and since you mentioned, thank you, since you mentioned endometrial thickness, and this is a, a, a conversation I've had with some patients in the past, again, not because I'm the expert in saying this is what you should have. I just said, what did you have and what was the, what was the decision-making protocol at that point? So what's your um, optimal thickness and where do you, you know, where do you draw the line? Where do you say, no, I'm not good enough, we're going to have to do something else, or I'm a little worried, we're going to have to stop this. What for you? And then we'll go through the other docs too. Well, I mean, there is a, like a consensus. I mean, the, the magic number is number seven, uh, right? So uh, anything above seven is considered to be... Uh, seven except, millimeters. Just seven, seven millimeters, millimeters just, just for our not, audience. Not yeah. seven yeah. centimeters. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but in this, in this case, could be could be uh, important the pattern of the endometrium. This is, yeah. this is quite important. You have a three-laminar endometrium, okay? Uh, even with uh, thin endometrium, six, seven millimeters could be okay. If you have no three laminar endometrium and you have a thin endometrium, it's a time to stop and to do a hysteroscopy uh, or a 3D scan in order to evaluate the, the cavity and uh, before going ahead with the, with the treatment. In any case, the preparation depends on the on the well the, the life of the of the of the patient because if the patient is is living in the in the same block uh, you have uh, all the opportunities to prepare the endometrium in the best way so you can start with a natural cycle if you need to cancel the natural cycle you can move to another cycle you can you can you can uh, well uh, look for the for the best the best thickness and, and everything but for example if the patient is is uh, in another country and uh, she has just three, four days, one week to do the treatment. Uh, well, to, to take on the risk that uh, the ovulation, a premature ovulation, or the a thin endometrium at the moment of the embryo transfer, and you have uh, under pressure to plan the embryo transfer is, is not a, a good idea. So uh, sometimes we would prefer to do a mock cycle uh before planning the real cycle and to be absolutely sure that at the time that the patient is in your uh, city everything is okay and you can uh, anticipate a, a bad endometrium and to do a hysteroscopy or something that uh, you prefer to do another preparation before starting the the real preparation and before uh well that the, the patient plan the the trip to go to your clinic Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Stelka, do you want to add anything to that? If not, I've got a question to, to, uh, you know, to pose to you. Do you want to add anything to that? Okay, so let's... Um, uh, so we heard mock, uh, mock cycle, as in mock preparation. What's your... And, and I will ask everybody, what's the situation with um, mock transfers these days? Do you always do a mock transfer? No? No. Does anyone do a mock transfer? Do you want to describe? Do you want to describe what it is for the audience and then say why you don't do it? I usually do mock cycles only when I expect that it will be low endometrium, uh, and usually when there is some distance between me and patient, and patients from our town, they are coming for like for a uh, transfer cycle, and and if everything is okay. And for me, seven is good minimum, and six, six, six is acceptable minimum. But uh, usually I try, again, preparation, maybe a bit higher dose of estradiol. But uh, I, I don't mock cycles every time, maybe 10 okay. times, not, no more. Okay. Again, that was mock cycles. So there's a sort of, uh, that's the preparation element. Um, what, what do you all do in terms of, you know, do you or don't you? Uh, and under what cir circumstances do you? do a mock transfer, the actual catheter part, you I think, know. I think, I think what, you, what you're describing is basically is to, if I can help the audience, audience understand, is you're doing Please. like a fake mock tr 
uh, you know, transfer yeah, procedure. Like, like said, yes. but yeah, explain it. Yeah, yeah. Transfer procedure without any embryos, right? Correct, correct, correct. Okay. So you're not risking so, the embryo. You're seeing, you're seeing right. if you can get into the uterine cavity. Exactly. And something. Right. This is something that you can do in any any part of a woman's cycle. You get, basically, what what you're doing is you're trying. Uh, to see, to, to, to test the cervical patency, right? If the cervix, if the cervical channel is open or if uh, at the time of the real embryo transfer, when you have embryos in the lab waiting to be transferred, you're gonna have like serious issue and a problem and you will not going to be able to, um, to transfer the embryos at the end of the day. So, I mean, at Serum, we always do uh, a mock embryo transfer. Um, basically, we have integrated the mock embryo transfer in a kind in a procedure that involves the um, evaluation of the cavity. So we do like um, high cosy, like an infusion of normal saline in the cavity at the first initial consultation of the couple of the woman. So it's a part of the routine basic investigation that uh, like sterile normal saline is infused inside the cavity during a process of a mock embryo transfer. And then if there's going to be a problem during the transfer, eventually, this is the time that you realize it, right? And then you can refer this patient to a hysteroscopy. But also at the same time, when you have like um, a successful aqua scan, you can visualize, you can estimate, evaluate the cavity for like polyps or fibroids or adhesions or the shape like, uh, um, you know, like when you have an arcuate uterus, like the shape of the cavity. So there are other things that this uh, this uh, procedure is very useful to diagnose before you actually transfer the embryos. Okay, I, perfect. So I would prefer not will, not to. You will do that. Sorry, no, I, I would prefer not to not to do uh, uh, invasive exploration in case that uh, the scan is absolutely okay. Uh, if we have a three laminar endometrium. And uh, with a normal thickness, uh, it's done in the previous cycle, right? It's not. It's not done in the same cycle to transfer embryos. You understand? No, 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 no. But but we uh, no, no, no. It's, it's uh, I respect the 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 the, the to do uh, some exploration about the cavity in the previous cycle in, in another cycle. But in in my usual practice, okay, uh, we reserve to do a high cosy or to do a, a hysteroscopy. In the case that uh, the 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 scan is not okay, okay, we prefer to check the endometrium. The endometrium is trilaminar with a good thickness. Uh, well, we don't do a mock transfer, taking into account that with uh, an expert uh, gynecologist, the probability to have uh, special problems at the moment of the embryo transfer is is very 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 low, if any. And you can, and you must uh, uh, well. Uh, mm, well, uh, have a discomfort for 1,000 patients in order to save one single embryo transfer. Okay, so this is the idea. But I respect that uh, that uh, to 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 check the cavity with a hysteroscopy before the first embryo transfer. But in 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 my well, in my view, we reserve the this kind of exploration when we have a, a, a non-normal scan. This is my opinion. Okay, and I'm glad there was some difference of opinion because you know when everybody agrees on everything, it sounds like everything's standardised, which of course, which of and, course it isn't. Um, so and I, I have I the same opinion. Like only only when there is some ultrasound normality, I okay. indicate the hysteroscopy. Or do, do any of you not do? And, and then we'll get to the questions because there's loads of questions now. So that's brilliant. Do any of you not do um, ultrasound guided transfer? Or does everybody do that now? Everybody does ultrasound guided transfer. Okay. Because, you know, today is about what are the things that, can, that you and the patient can do to optimize your chances? Well, you know, I started a long time ago and once upon I, a time they didn't use ultrasound. I, right? I, so, I was trained like that. No, uh, you know, no guidance with ultrasound many years ago. And, and you know, I, I, I get it. There's a lot of people who have good touch. And I, I imagine there are many doctors who say, I, I can do this without ultrasound. I've got the touch. I just think the ultrasound is giving you the security, right? And and it's visible for the patient. It's you know, there's a lot of reassurance I think built into that. Yes. Okay, yes. cool. Okay, this is a, a special through. moment, and and the patient must be absolutely sure that everything is okay, okay with the embryo transfer because taking into account that we have 40, 50 percent probabilities of to fail, 
okay, because this is the probability that we can have in an embryo transfer, the maximum probability to, to have a pregnancy is 60% no more. And we must be absolutely sure that in case that we fail, it's because we are not lucky, but not because uh, the embryo transfer was suboptimal. And this is the reason that sometimes we don't do a uh, mock uh, transfer, but we do after loading. And we uh, uh, do, do load the embryos in the catheter after uh, being absolutely sure that you are inside the cavity with the ultrasound. Alan, since, okay. since you mentioned that, can I just, uh, one second, Please. can I just say that, um, I, I mean, I, I believe that I'm probably are wrong, but my colleagues are doing uh, the transfers with uh, abdominal ultrasound scanning. Is that, is that correct? Yes. Yes. So, I mean, we have developed a method that we do it with internal, vaginal. Uh, so, I mean, when you do it like that, you have like an absolute incredible view of the channel, you know, cervical canal, the channel and the uterus, and you can actually leave the embryos exactly where you want. It's, it's, it's magnificent to see. Uh, sometimes I do it also, but only in cases when, when transfer is difficult, like you can feel it in, in your fingers, that is some problem, okay? And it's not visible by abdominal way, I use it also, but I feel like octopus when I do this, okay? <laughs> <laughs> that, that, no, no, no. That, 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 I have some experience with the the, the, the vaginal scan uh, guiding the the embryo transfer or trans transrectal scan, and the image is fantastic and and it's it's, it's beautiful the, the the way that you can see the embryo transfer. But it's sometimes it's uncomfortable for the patient and uncomfortable for the gynecologist <laughs> because it's it's uh, well it's it's. Amazing. You need, you need uh, one or more hands. Yes, yes, yeah, the, 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 absolutely. It's like an octopus. But, but uh, the 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 end, the the results are reassuring, taking into account that the studies say that the probability of pregnancy is not different between the vaginal or abdominal. But it's for sure that with the vaginal, the image is is fantastic, and and sometimes the patient is more comfortable taking into account that she can see powerfully the signal in, in the scan. Okay, perfect. Um, I'm trying to group questions together. So here's one that's got more information than another one, but it's essentially asking the question, um, what day of transfer should they do? Now, this particular person is um, 44 using their own eggs. And I'm, I'm interested, if you, if you are going to say age matters and then we'll do a different day of transfer, then please say it. But are you all doing day five transfer? I mean, it's going to be... If you're not, to give me a reason why you're not. That's that's what we want to hear. It's not a judgment, just that's well, what people I mean, want to hear. Are we talking about 44-year-old patient? Okay, we'll start with that one and then we'll generalize. Okay, well, um, it's going to be, you know, my, my view is going to be difficult sometimes for a 44-year-old patient to reach blastocyst stage. So, we you know, you while waiting for day five to reach blastocyst, you may have no embryos to transfer. And these embryos could be absolutely fine, you know, because, I mean, there is no better cultivator for embryos than the uterus of, of the woman. So, if you, if you have embryos that they look fine and they have reached day two or day three, but you are worried that they may, may not reach day five and you don't have, like, you know, I mean, you have a 44 year old patient, you don't have like 10 embryos usually. You may have like two, right? Or, or three. And you, I mean, on day two, you see that one is good and the other one is not so good. So you have to make a decision if you're going to transfer day two or day three, or you take the risk not having no embryos at all to transfer on day five. Okay. Yeah, so 100 percent of day five. And uh, 100%, regardless of regardless of age, regardless of yes, just 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 when the, when the, when the woman say, well, uh, I need to find peace of mind that uh, I would prefer to transfer the embryos at day three. We we can transfer the embryos at day three, but but uh, well, approximately one hundred embryos on day five. One hundred percent on day five. Uh, well, the, the the results of the of the trials are very reassuring taking into account that uh, in the, the, the last SRE meeting in, a, in Holland, uh, a study, uh, well, randomized control study, comparing day three to day five, 
and uh, the the cumulative lay birth was was the, the same. So uh, it's logical to think that we don't uh, lose embryos uh, in the in the culture in the in the in the labs that we have uh, nowadays. So uh, we can uh, say to the patient that in case that the embryo failed to arrive to day five, is because the embryo is not able, and uh, the the well the, 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 to transfer the embryos at day five is, is in, in my opinion is is the the, the dominant strategy. Um, I can okay. feel for, for women on at the age of forty four even. So, well, so did, you, did you you it's... speak with the patient and say, well, uh, we you you are forty four and this is the last opportunity. Okay, and we are going to to transfer at day two, and the the the, 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 the woman agree. Uh, for me, it's perfect because you are not going to have a lower probability of pregnancy. But we can must I, take into account that sometimes sometimes we transfer an embryo to day two, day three, and the embryo failed to implant, and the woman say, well, or think that uh, my body reject the embryos. Okay. Yes. And sometimes start with an add-on therapies uh, because they understand or immunology treatment or something like this because they have dust that they reject the embryos. And sometimes it's an embryo that failed to arrive to the blastocyst stage. And uh, we must put in balance everything. And of course, it's very respectable to transfer the embryo day two, day three. But in my opinion, my, my, the dominant strategy is to, to arrive to day five in order to check that, well, you, you fail because the embryo failed to arrive to the blastocyst stage. No, you don't fail because you reject the embryos. Yes, uh, I, I completely, I completely agree. Yes, yes, yes. I completely agree. Patients can't understand uh, that the embryo is stopped in the uterus. They feel that something was wrong, immunology or bed transfer, or they made some mistake. But when we don't have embryo, it's clear for them. So finally, they are maybe early open to take egg donation when they can see that uh, free cycles without embryo, then we do every time transfer. And then uh, I completely agree. Then immunologic test and uh, hysteroscopy and so on and so on and so on. And... Let, let's, let's move on from this, even though I know it's really important. And I think there's not just a difference of practice here. There is some you know controversy over whether leaving an embryo in culture is the best thing to do it's what people do but there is a question about it and that's fine so let's move on um i'm going to ask a general question but based on a specific patient question so lady here says i'm 39 i've had transfer of three normal tested embryos i imagine pgta so euploid she's using her own eggs she's already had hysteroscopy immunology everything's okay no implantation ever now i know there could be lots of things but we're talking about what could we do differently? So I want to address the endometrial test now because there's other questions. So um, Dr. Stelka, do you offer any endometrial testing, you know, like receptivity or do you want to cover receptivity? And then yes. we'll go on to other things, please. Yes, but not in, in first line. Usually after two or three transfers, uh, negative transfers, and it should be good quality of embryos. But um, sometimes it's very difficult to explain to patients that uh, embryos uh, weren't of good quality, but I use it and I have good experience. If, okay, there, is so some, if there is some recommendation for a different day, I have usually very good experience. Okay, so what's interesting here is this, the, the question I read out, which is a real question, um, that absolutely meets your criteria. She's, she's had three normal tested embryos, her own eggs, She's had the transfers. She's done yes. other things as well, and she's looking for another option, right? That's and a thing. So that's that's an option. Okay. Does anyone want to address the fact that because this is another question, and you know, I worked for the company that developed that test, so I know a bit about it. But does anyone want to address whether you should still use it given some of the equivocal results? I wouldn't say negative results. I'd say equivocal results. Does anyone want to address that? Because you know, patients are understandably saying. Well, some people say it works. Some people say it doesn't work. What am I supposed to do? Okay. Anyone? Yeah, go ahead then. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, What's your feeling about the data? This is a complicated, a complicated situation. A complicated situation. Mm -hmm. And when, when, when you have doubts about, you must be honest with the patient. And 
well, you are desperate, the patient are, uh, is, is, is desperate, but, uh, well, uh, we, we, we have the, the, the well, to, to explain to the patient the, the real evidence, okay, and uh, to, to go ahead with another treatment. In case that the patient prefer to, to, to go to the immunologist, we respect the opinion of the patient. And in case the immunologist have some add-on therapy, we understand that we can use this add-on therapy. But we must explain to the patient that when we have a good quality embryo, in the last paper published in Human Reproduction by Filippo Valdi and, 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 and his team say that in the first five embryo transfer with a chromosomically normal embryo, the probability of success is not different from the, the, the fourth attempt and the second attempt. So uh, we must try again and, and, and have the confidence with the patient to, to try again. Of course, after ruling out that any problem is with the uterus and, and after uh, discussing with the patient, the probability to use an add-on so to go to the hematologist or, or immunologist, but we are desperate and we can respect all the opinions. Okay, Dr. Marides, do you have you have an opinion? Yeah, Please, yeah. Well, I agree. I agree with uh, Joaquin. I just want to say that um, basically what you're describing, what you you were describing, was recurrent implantation failure, right? That's the thing. Uh, and my opinion is that there is not such a thing as um, unexplained recurrent implantation failure. Basically, the term unexplained uh, describes our inability to find a reason why this patient does not get pregnant. So if you if you continue doing the same thing, you're going to get like um, if, uh, a negative result again and again. If you don't change something, you know, to what you do, and if you don't get to investigate more to find what is the cause of this recurrent implantation failure, and you just keep transferring embryos, you're just going to get the same negative result. And I mean, there is like a spectrum of tests you can do. I mean, uh, Joaquin mentioned immune of course you can test for natural killer cells for example uh, another thing you can do is you can test for like uh, uh, subclinical uh, in infections you know chronic infections that can could be there for many years and the patient does not have any symptoms at all like pain or abnormal discharge or whatever and they may you know be like a main reason that someone cannot get pregnant with like very very good embryos okay there are, there is a spectrum of, of tests you can do um, I mean, you mentioned the ERA test, which is something that could be very useful for some patients, you know. Um, you can do the microbiome, as I said, you can take like a sample from the uterus and you can test it for possible bacteria that they could uh, ruin your chance to get pregnant. Okay, so good. Um, that was another series of questions. We might as well continue with that. So how strong do you think the evidence is for the microbiome um, having an influence on pregnancy and, and, you know, outcomes, because that's what it's based on, isn't it? Is it for me, the question, or for everybody? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, for you, for you. you we're continuing with you, and then we'll see if there's... For you, for you. <laughs> um, well, I mean, from my um, clinical experience, because sometimes um, you end up doing a hysteroscopy to a patient that has recurrent implantation failure, right? And you do the hysteroscopy, and you see that I mean, clinically, clinically, this this patient has, you know, an obvious endometritis. Okay, and sometimes can be severe endometritis. So, I mean, my view on this topic is that you cannot carry on doing embryo transfers until you treat this endometritis, and then you cannot you cannot just use empirical treatment of random antibiotics, okay, to treat an endometritis that you see. You have the clinical views during hysteroscopy. You cannot do like a standard protocol, okay, empirically. You have to take a sample and send it for PCR to have like to know exactly what are the specific bacteria that's causing this, and then you can give like targeted antibiotics. Perfect. So, okay, so somebody else, um, let's say uh, Dr. Stelkel, are you using this okay. test at all? Are you using okay. this test? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. So, so, so let's. That's chronic endometritis. That's you know an infection that, as medical professionals, you're going to want to treat and solve. The other side of this is dysbiosis and, um, you know, increasing the amount of lactobacillus, the so-called healthy bacteria, which yeah. a lack of which has been associated with a poor outcome. So, what's your feeling about that? And what um, if if you test it and want to do something about it? What's your experience? And what uh, method would you use to treat it? 
Okay. Uh, with uh, chronic endometritis, it's clear, okay? But uh, other question is some, some disbalance. And for me, it's a very important question. And I asked here in uh, university, uh, if it is possible to change microbiome like this, okay? That you will, you will give antibiotics for 14 days, and then you will, you will uh, recommend lactobacillus and, and you will feel that it will be better, but I don't think so that it's possible to change it like this, okay? And they, they answered me that uh, microbioma is uh, like sometimes, maybe it's genetically determined. So, so it's very difficult to change it. So my question, my question is if, if I can, if I find some disbalance, if I can change it. And my opinion is maybe uh, then test it. Uh, it's better to recommend to everybody to use uh, vaginal lactobacilli in transfer cycle, maybe two times per, per week, and maybe the result will be the same. I have the, the experience like this. Difficult okay, question. And I'm, yeah, and I'm no, I'm no expert, but I just want to comment on that genetic basis. It, you know, it sounds plausible, but gut microbiome, um, when they've looked at identical twins, so identical, you know, essentially identical genetic mm -hmm. con uh, constitution, they only share something like 19% of the same microbiome. So I don't think it's very genetically determined. I know that's the gut, but I, I don't think it is. But um, so do you want to say something? You said vaginal uh, lactobacillus and the company I worked for promoted that very much. But I started speaking to someone about um, vaginal rather than uh, endometrial. And they were saying oral lactobacillus, if you take the right one, does reach the endometrium eventually, you know, it gets the vagina, which, you know, it's kind of not, not intuitive. Yeah but that it does and maybe that's something to do with um you know the proximity to the the gut and the vagina right that's you know maybe it's that they weren't sure what the mechanism was so i just wondered if you would currently say vaginal because we we understand how that works so i'm not promoting taking oral um lactobacillus what would you agree with that what, what's your feeling uh, i think that yes oral lacto it's clear because the strongest microbioma is intestinal microbioma. Okay, but it's it's long way to uh, to, to improve it. Okay, so uh, the patient is asking for transfer right now, no, after six months. Okay, so okay. the reason why I use vaginal lacto lactobacillus when I use it. Okay, perfect. Right, I'm going to go to um, Dr. Wakian again. Would when would you recommend? This is what I was trying to get at the right at the beginning. When would you recommend? additional medications and you know, not the standard um, protocols. So heparin, steroids, intralipids, IVIG, you know, all that add on stuff. When would you recommend it, if at all? I don't recommend uh, this kind of therapies in, in my patients. Never recommend. I accept to use uh, this uh, medication in case that the patient asks me for this medication because when you must recognize to the patient that you have no uh, a clear idea that the, the cause of the failure and we must respect the, the opinion of the patient. But we prefer not to use this kind of therapy because we have the same evidence that this therapy can improve, that it can impair the probability of pregnancy. So uh, I, I would prefer not, not to use this, this, this medication and in case that the patient uh, uh, asks for, for, for that something, of course, the, the heparin or the baby asp aspirin is, is the, the medication that they have uh, less secondary effects. And, uh, well, the, but the, the evidence with this kind of medication, of course, intralipids or, or IBIG, I prefer and corti steroids, I, I, I would prefer not because uh, we must take into account that this is the 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 the, the idea about the about uh, going to to day fight embryo transfer is that uh, when you uh, add something, it's very difficult to retire in the next in another attempt. So uh, you fail, you add heparin, and you fail, you add, you you use heparin and steroids, and you fail, you use heparin steroids and uh, immunomodul Im uh, immunomodulators like uh, dolkine or hydroxychloroquine and if you fail you add something and at the end 
and 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 you have a patient that uh, with the esteroids continuously because you are uh, they are in a, in a treatment and preparing for another treatment and will cancel because the endometrium is not okay but they are with the esteroids so uh, I would prefer not to start this uh, spiral of 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 uh, additional medication that we have no evidence but of course we must recognize that we are desperate, the patient are, is desperate, and we can discuss the use of this kind of medication. Okay, and look, I, I think it's taken as read that unless the patient asks for something that's known to be harmful, that you're going to listen to them. Every doctor I've spoken to on this series has said, well, if the patient insists, then we have a discussion. So let's take that as read, but this is really about whether it's something that's in your protocol. It's something that you would, you know, frontline use, which the answer I'm getting from you is definitely no. Does, does, um, do either of the other doctors have a different I, opinion on this? I, I think this add-ons is not for everybody. Okay. But if you have a patient that has lab, some uh, specific clinical indications, uh, it would be a mistake not to actually give uh, this um, additional medication, even if there is sometimes not like uh, conclusive evidence if it's going to work or not. For example, if you have a patient that uh, clearly has thrombophilia or antiphospholipid syndrome, right? Although it's not, I mean, you know, there is, it's, it's debatable if this, this thing can actually uh, interfere with implantation, right? But if you have a patient that has thrombophilia or antiphospholipid syndrome, it would be for me it would be absolutely necessary to supplement this patient with low molecular weight heparin. And if it has antiphospholipid syndrome, to add also aspirin. If you have a patient that has increased very high natural killer cells, right? For me, it would be absolutely mandatory after after the embryo transfer to supplement this patient with 25 milligrams of prednisolone. Prednisolone. All right, and you also have to consider if you're going to administer IV, IG, or intralipids. So, I mean, these are special medications, not for everybody, but for a specific patients that absolutely need that. Okay, so a medical, a, a real clinical indication to do it, is yeah. what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Dr. Stelke, any any difference or agree? No, I agree. agree. Okay. I agree. I usually use it when immunologists recommend me. Okay. I, I, I use it. Perfect. Right. You're getting the next question. Um, and it is because I've seen a couple of questions on this. Does embryo glue aid implantation and do you use it? <laughs> and I've got, I've got something to, I know, I got know something the to say about this. Well, I, know the um, I, use want it. To, I want I... to hear I want to hear each of you say it if you've got a different answer. So what's your opinion? Do you use it and do you think it works? I'm not asking the mechanism. I'm asking, do you think it works? I use, I use it. Uh, I use uh, embryo glue some years ago, and I decided not to continue because it's a bit expensive and no, no okay, differences were seen. But nowadays, after the, the guidelines of the ESRI about recurrent implantation failure, that nothing, uh, nothing uh, works uh, but the embryo glue, <laughs> I, I, I offer the, to the patients and I explain to the patient all the possibilities. One of the possibilities that I explain to the patient is the, the, the possibility to use embryo glue. Okay. Uh, others, this is your chance. And then I want to say something about embryo glue, um, <laughs> which is surprise you, I think. So do, does anyone else use it? We use it. Yeah. And do, do, do you use it because you know, it's there and patients ask for it, or do you use it because you believe it's working? We believe it's working. Okay, perfect, thank you. So I wanna give you a little story. Um, when I was an embryologist, when I was actually in the lab, I did a study, uh, it got abstract published, not, not full published. The reason we didn't full publish it is because it, it didn't show any benefit, right, in frozen embryo transfers. This was a very long time ago, early days of embryo glue, and I wasn't convinced that it worked. And then since then, all the evidence, meta-analyses, you know, where they look at all the papers together, and, and as you said, the guidelines now, which are usually very anti-everything, actually favor embryo glue. So I'm surprised, and I, was, I had a bias against it from the point of view I didn't get any good results, but I kind of have to concede it's one of the few things that actually has evidence saying it works. Right. So I don't know how it works. I don't understand how it works as an embryologist, but somehow it seems to work. So Joaquin, to your point about cost, 
I, I get it. You know, you've got lots of priorities and competing things to do. But um, I used to say to my guys in the lab, they go, oh, it's a bit expensive to do such and such. And I say, the first question is, does it work? And then we'll worry about the cost. So that's my that's my philosophy, right? If it doesn't work, I don't care how much it costs, don't do it. But um, it, yeah, I think cost can be worked on is what I would say. And if it doesn't do any harm, I, I have less of a problem with it than some other things. So that's my little take on embryo glue. And, and you know, I was against it from the beginning, if you know what I mean. Um, so I think that's covered embryo glue. Thank you. Um, here's a very a much more clinical question. Uh, let's go to Do Dr. Stelkel because you didn't get the last one really. Um, what do you recommend? Do you recommend doing anything different for endometriosis? Would you would you favour natural or medicated? Um, but would you would you prepare anything differently? Depends. Okay. Uh, in case of only endometriosis. I use the same protocol. Um, usually, uh, if it is stronger endometriosis, uh, I recommend uh, to do uh, a free source strategy and uh, cryo embryo transfer later. Uh, and if adenomyosis is present, it's much more good. difficult. Yeah. Much more difficult. Okay, good. That's what they were actually asking: endometriosis and adenomyosis. So let's go. Yeah. Okay, so if only endometriosis, I use the same procedure like uh, like normal patient without endometriosis. Okay, okay. any any differences there? No? Well, in case that? That, that endometriosis, sometimes I would prefer to do a free soul uh, policy and to prepare the, uh, the endometrium in another condition and not during the embryo transfer. Okay, yes. but the evidence is, is not very strong, but we would prefer to do to do a, a, a frozen embryo transfer and no fresh embryo transfer in patients with uh, endometriosis. Well, if, if, you have, if you have, if you have, let's say, um, like an active endometriosis, uh, I mean, it depends on the stage as well, of course, but if you have an active endometriosis, it's always a good, uh, you know, clinical strategy to down regulate the patient, you know, wait three months and then transfer frozen embryos. So this is, this, this okay. kind of protocol is practically in, in my clinic, mandatory for the patients with adenomyosis. Yes. And in the patients with endometriosis, sometimes if we have an implantation failure, we, we use this kind of, of, of protocol the, with a, a, a long down regulation. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Well, we're back to like the beginning again, but I think we're warmed up now. So I think I'll get some answers from you. And it's okay to say, no, I don't recommend anything. But over the last few sessions of this we've talked about you know what can i do if i'm over 40 um what can i do to improve my egg quality and the, you know the supplement word comes up a lot okay so what supplements can i take vitamin e coenzyme q um so uh, I'll, I'll go to dr meridius first on this one do you and we're, talk, we're not talking about egg quality we're talking about preparation for embryo transfer so you've already got your embryo uh, is there anything in terms of those kind of medic uh, supplements or medications? I, I, I would like to go like one step before that, actually. Okay. Because I mean, you, the first you mentioned that how can I improve air quality, right? What is what supplements can I take to improve my air quality when I am 41, 42, 43? And uh, you know, our opinion is that there's not a lot you can take <clears throat> to improve your uh, air quality, but there is something that you can do, and this is called like ovarian PRP. So, um, I mean, we, we do it regularly for this kind of group of patients, and we have seen quite an improvement uh, also in the, the numbers of, of eggs that we collect after a um, stimulated cycle, and also we have seen you, an improvement you briefly, in the quality of the eggs we get. Can, thank you, because that is one of the questions as well. Can you briefly, briefly I'm sorry, explain this, what you're breaking is. up. Can you briefly explain PRP, briefly? What? I'm sorry, I'm losing you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I, I can. Yes. I can hear you. Can you briefly explain PRP for the audience? Yeah. So uh, PRP stands basically for platelet-rich plasma. So in other words, is a procedure that uh, we take from the patient from the peripheral blood. We take a small amount of blood, about 60 ml, and this this uh, this blood is being processed and centrifuged, and you end up with uh, with a solution that's very rich in uh, in um, platelets and uh, other uh, uh, growth factors and bioactive proteins. And then you have um, the option to inject 
this uh, this PRP solution in the ovaries. If you have like a, a situation, an issue with the ovarian quality or, or ovarian numbers, uh, of, uh, numbers of our of um, our sites, all you have the option to in to infuse that PRP solution also in the endometrium. If you have like an endometrium that is thin or bad quality, right? Um, and I'm, our clinical experience so far is very favorable uh, towards PRP, and we have seen um, pregnancies. Um, and also have seen, I mean, it doesn't make miracles, I have to say this, okay, so it's not like a woman who is like 42 is going to go for like two uh, eggs into like 10 eggs, right, and it's not going to be um, uh, something like that is going to work for everybody, but we have seen that it can work for some patients, and we have seen also a reduction in the uh, levels of um, FSH, Right, an improvement of the levels of AMH. So, uh, our, you know, my opinion is that works. So this is okay. something. To do. Okay, no, that that's good. Um, uh, Dr. Yase, do you want to say something about it? And if if you do it, if you don't do it, and what you think about the evidence? Because we've heard opinion and clinical uh, practice, you know, experience, clinical experience. But um, do you want to say anything about the evidence for it? For the PRP. Yes. Yes, the, the 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 present evidence is very 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 weak. It's very 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 weak. Okay. Uh, we have well, we have different use. One one use is the thin endometrium, okay, and the recurrent implantation failure, unexplained recurrent implantation failure. Another use is the the reactivation of the ovary. Of uh, the the term is ovarian reju rejuvenation, okay. And uh, the, with the ovarian rejuvenation, uh, the, the, the ovarian activation, the evidence is, is very, 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 very weak. But sometimes we try. Sometimes we try in, in a situation that uh, the, the, the Dr. Meridi say that is, is a very, very low, low ovarian reserve. And uh, before moving to the egg donation and, and the, 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 the patient uh, try to, to, to obtain a, a better uh, uh, a number of of the eggs uh, we can try, and the other possibility is the the, the use for the recurrent implantation failure and and the thin endometrium. We have good results in this in this kind of situations. We have good results, and uh, we offer to the patients this situation. Well, uh, sp explaining that this is pseudo experimental situation and and but but we try we try to with uh, with prp okay thank you um any you got a different opinion um marcel anything different or you no, agree with that? okay the same opinion okay so here's here's a really interesting we're gonna do about three more questions before we wrap up um here's a interesting i, I have sorry i have a, a, about the supplement I have okay, an please, observation, yes. okay, before moving to another question about the supplements. Uh, I think that a, a normal uh, woman with a, a healthy woman uh, doesn't need to, to, to take uh, any special supplement. But we must take into account another, another part that, that we sometimes not uh, take into consideration is the lifestyle. And uh, sometimes we have a woman with uh, uh, implantation failure and uh, we have a lot of medication, but the woman is uh, with uh, overweight and with uh, no especially healthy habits. So first of all, uh, we must uh, recommend to, to correct the habits and to have a, a, a normal, normal weight or, or not especially uh, obese. And uh, this is this is for me is fundamental because uh, sometimes we are using medication that we have no evidence, and we have evidence the overweight is uh, at the contribution for the failure, and the probability of success is higher if we obtain a better uh, a lifestyle, a better lifestyle. So uh, we think that we must we must uh, well speak about with the patient in the in the office before taking into consideration special medication or supplement. Okay, thank you. That was that was really useful, actually. The lifestyle thing, you know, I I often say to again, I'm not an expert on supplements, but when people say I'm taking three times the recommended dose, I say, you know what, 
um, I think you're probably wasting money and possibly doing yourself harm. <laughs> so, so how about focusing on lifestyle? Um, okay, let's talk about that magic thing, embryo transfer number. Uh, so obviously the world has moved very much towards single embryo transfer, even with older patients if they test their embryos. So um, I imagine you're all doing a fair amount of single embryo transfer. A nod of the head will help. Um, so could you say under what circumstances you would transfer two or, or possibly more than two? Um, let's start with you, Dr. Stalkel, and then we'll move around. Okay, so... <laughs> difficult <laughs> difficult question. I, I never remember yeah, well, more than one. Uh, last time, it was a uh, situation, okay, patient from USA, one, day five, fresh transfer, one blastosis and one morula. So I transferred both, okay, 40 years old. So she she, she has twins, okay, so. Oh, so, yeah, okay. <laughs> so, so maybe one transfer per year, okay. Uh, okay, so it's very it's very rare. Okay, that's, that's really helpful, though, because I, I think it's important. Um, you know, I remember having a conversation with someone who had IVF quite a long time ago, but you will understand my point. They felt that they hadn't been adequately prepared for the conversation about the number. But I don't think there's so much of a conversation about the number anymore. It's it's defaulting to a single embryo a little bit. Is that fair yes. to say that? Yeah. OK. Um, Dr. Maridis, can you say something about numbers for transfer, please? Uh, OK, well, I think it depends on the clinical scenario you're facing. OK, so uh, of course. If, if you have someone who's like 34 years old and it's like your first IVF, right? And you have good embryos. Um, I mean, usually these patients, when you explain a situation, their first embryo transfer, they're absolutely scared that they may get twins. So, uh, I mean, everybody's happy by transferring one embryo, right? So there's no question about transferring more. But if you say you have a woman, a cup, you know, that's like over 40 and she had a few embryo transfers before and her embryos are not that good, right? You can think, you can consider transferring more. You can transfer two and actually in Greece we have, we can transfer up to four embryos after the age of 40. So it's not an easy question to, to answer. I mean, even, even, even for that, you know, uh, latter woman I spoke about, there are some people that you say to them that, look, I mean, your embryos are not that good, so we may we should transfer more than one, right? And they're, they're so absolutely scared about the possibility of twin or triplets that they would never transfer more than one. So, I mean, you have you give them your clinical advice as a specialist, right? But you also have to respect their uh, opinion. Of course, at the end of the day, it's their cycle and their life. But, I mean, depends the different, different clinical scenarios. And it's always helpful to discuss with the patients. You give them the advice and they decide at the end of the day what they want to do. Well, in a way, that's a perfect answer. And I'm glad you said that because when you say it's not an easy question, no, because it's individual and there's different clinical scenarios and it demonstrates that you're having a conversation. It isn't a tick a box and say it's got to be this. Um, so I, I'm, I, I, I'm happy with that conversation with that kind of answer. Um, uh, Joaquin, do you have a do you have something to add to that conversation about numbers? I tried. Well, I transferred just just one in, in, in practically all the scenarios. I never recommend transfer more than one to the patient. Okay. Sometimes we transfer two in case that the patient uh, prefer transfer two and I accept. But uh, after a, more than one conversation, okay, but I'm uh, working in IBF for more than 25 years and I have enough uh, horrible twin pregnancy and triplets in my life. So I try to have just three kind of patients under 35 over 35 with PGTA and egg donation. And in these scenarios, uh, the probability of implantation is high and uh, I transfer just, just, just one. Thank you, that, that's really clear. And just for context for the patients, you know, when, when us um, healthcare professionals use words like horrible twins and triplets, what we mean is those <laughs> unfortunate situations where the outcomes are really bad, low birth weight, preterm, cerebral palsy, et cetera, et cetera, which is more common in those twin and triplet pregnancies. So that's what these lovely doctors are trying to avoid for you is these bad outcomes. Um, so final question, and then we'll wrap up. We've had lots of questions. It's been fantastic. I'm sorry if we haven't answered everything. Some of them are a bit specific or not, not clear what's being asked. You can always contact um, 
my IVF, my IVF answers or the individual doctors themselves, where I'm sure they'd love to hear from you. So final question, and this is relevant to um, something I was telling the guys before we started. I'm, I'm at a conference and the queen of Malaysia is there and she very bravely told her story about um, doing 17 IVF cycles and, you know, successful in some of them. Uh, but she said for some of the post-embryo transfers, she had bed rest for months. And, you know, some of this is a bit up from a few years ago. And I wanted to ask the clinician's opinion about bed rest, whether it's a thing of the past or there may be some certain situations where you, it might be indicated. But what's your feeling about bed rest? Um, Dr. Maridis, you first, please. Uh, I wouldn't support it, to be honest. I mean, I think it's if, if after the embryo transfer, she would remain, you know, in bed for about half an hour. This is this is more than enough for us. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Stelko. Same. Yes. I have, I'm thinking that, 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 that it can be harmful to, to stay in a bed for 14 days. Okay, it's very bad for head and doesn't yeah. have chances for implantation. Okay, so. perfect. I'm pretty sure you're going to say the same thing. I'm kind of hoping you are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you you agree. Good. Okay. Well, um, thanks so much, doctors, for your time and your energy and yeah. your enthusiasm. I think that's been really helpful. I hope it's been helpful for everybody watching. Again, sorry if not all of your questions are answered, but you can get in touch with, with any or all of the doctors. Um, Caroline, who runs this, will send a survey out to you. Please respond because it's to help us make this better, you know, to help us think of new things to talk about, different formats and so on. So we really appreciate your feedback. But thank you all so much. And we'll see you again on the, on the next session. Okay. Thank you very much, Alan. Fantastic. Thank, thank you very much. Bye -bye. I appreciate you with this. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.